Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Baltimore. Canada has always had the global reputation as being a sort of peaceful country, supporting the United Nations and the Blue Helmets actions. But many have also suggested that Canada, in fact, has been a quite willing complementary partner to the Anglo-American alliance and various military adventures by the United States, with the notable exception of Iraq. But from Vietnam right through to actions in Haiti, Canada, in fact, has followed its own interest in perhaps not such a loving, peaceful way as it likes to think of itself. And now Stephen Harper's new government is perhaps going even further in that direction. And joining us to talk about all of that is Eve Engler. He's a Canadian commentator and author. His most recent book is The Ugly Canadian, Stephen Harper's Foreign Policy. Thanks for joining us. And Eve joins us from Vancouver. Thanks for having me. So we've, uh, we've decided we're going to go through your book. We're going to do a segment per chapter because each chapter kind of deals with a different piece of the Harper foreign policy. And in the course of that, we'll talk a little bit about whether this really is that quantitative or qualitative change from Canada's past. But we're going to start with environmental policy and the issue of the tar sands and such. So what is Harper's policy when it comes to climate change, global warming, and what may be one of the Earth's number one source of carbon dioxide, and that's the tar sands located in Stephen Harper's political base in Alberta. Stephen Harper's government has made it very clear that they oppose basically all international efforts to reduce uh, carbon emissions from the atmosphere. They've pulled out of the Kyoto Protocol uh, back in December. They've uh, uh, undermined, sabotaged, really uh, repeated uh, international climate negotiation meetings. Five years running, they've received the uh, colossal fossil given out by hundreds of environmental groups for being the country that's done the most at these different international uh, meetings to uh, to undermine uh, the negotiations. So they've been very clearly uh, uh, um, opposed to these these efforts. And in the context of the climate uh, vulnerability monitor reporting that 400,000 people are already dying because of climate disturbances, that's of course mostly not Canadians. That's mostly people in pay vulnerable people in places like uh, Bangladesh and Ethiopia. But the Harper government uh, really doesn't uh, doesn't care about um, uh, about the consequences of, of runaway global warming, and that is because, as you mentioned, their base of power is really the the tar sands. Obviously, Harper himself is a, a, a member of parliament from Calgary, where is, which is the uh, the home to most of these uh, these different Canadian energy companies, and uh, the Conservative Party's base of political power is, of course, Alberta, which is uh, the home to most of uh, most of the tar sands industry. So the Harper government has um, has been very hostile to uh, to attempts to uh, to reduce carbon. And, and does certainly the preponderance of Canadian scientists support the idea that there's uh, human caused climate change and carbon dioxide needs to be controlled? Uh, and and many scientists that are working even for the government, I think, have, have certainly supported this. But does the Harper government actually oppose this on a theoretical level, uh, disputing climate change science, or are they simply don't act on it. They, at this point, they don't publicly dispute it. There's a uh, somewhat infamous letter that Harper sent in 2002 when he was in the, the opposition. It was a fundraising letter uh, where he does dispute, the, quite clearly dispute the science of the matter and, and calls the Kyoto Protocol a socialist plot uh, to, to, uh, to get money out of, uh, out of the wealthy countries. Now, as prime minister, he doesn't dispute the science of it, but he does go about cutting hundreds of millions of dollars to the scientists that are investigating the matter. He goes about uh, muzzling the different uh, scientists working for Environment Canada that previously at least were discussing the issues with the dominant media. So at this point, he doesn't publicly deny uh, climate change, but he, all his actions suggest that he, he just doesn't care. Now, one of the quotes from your book, as you say, Harper's on the front lines of fighting for dirty oil. Uh, well, two parts to my question. Is this really that different than the previous Liberal government? Like, did they really take any effective measures? Or was their rhetoric a little more, you know, friendly towards fighting climate change? But did they actually do anything about it? Certainly the previous Liberal government wasn't, their rhetoric was a lot better, and they, they obviously signed the Kyoto Protocol and then more or less did little to, uh, to adhere to it. Um, but what is distinct about uh, the Conservatives is that 
the intensity of the lobbying uh, against low carbon fuel standards in uh, in the U.S., particularly in the case of California, or the fuel quality directive in the Euro- in the European Union, they have been lobbying very aggressively against all attempts to reduce carbon emissions from fuel sources in the U.S. and Europe. And when when California pass a low-carbon fuel standard, immediately Canadian officials were there lobbying against low-carbon fuel standard, and specifically to not have tar sands oil be identified as a heavy-emitting uh, fuel source, which, which it, of course, is. And, uh, and you know, they, when Wisconsin legislatures discussed passing a low-carbon fuel standard, Canadian officials were in Wisconsin saying that if you pass this uh, legislation, you're going to be dependent on Hugo Chavez for your oil uh, uh, rather than uh, the, good, the good people of Alberta. Um, so in the case of the fuel quality directive, in the European Union has been discussing for a while, between mid-2009 and mid-2011, there was 110 official Canadian lobbying visits with uh, British and European Union officials on the issue to, to, to exclude the tar sands from the fuel quality directive. And this prompted a Finnish member of the European Union par- Parliament to say that she's never witnessed a more aggressive lobbying campaign from any state. There's been uh, more, more aggressive lobbying campaigns from dif- different industries, but no state has ever lobbied so aggressively about an issue in the European Union. Mm. There is a very uh, aggressive campaign. It includes the Canadian embassies in, um, in London working with Shell, in, in, uh, in France working with Total, in, in Norway working with Statoil. Uh, companies that have investments in the tar sands and the Canadian uh, embassies in those countries are, are working to build uh, opposition from the oil companies, the, the domestic oil companies in each European country to oppose uh, the fuel quality directive. And similarly, in the U.S., there's been close coordination between the Canadian embassy in Washington and the uh, and the d- different domestic uh, American oil companies to build opposition, internal opposition to uh, different attempts to reduce carbon emissions from from fuel sources uh, um, in the U.S. So there has been a a pretty uh, this is this is unique in the history of Canadian foreign policy to have a Canadian government being so aggressive against all. Uh, attempts within the U.S. to you know, pass some 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 modest, modestly progressive uh, policy. And what's this done in terms of Canada's reputation uh, in in the rest of the world? There's certainly uh, one of the reasons the the Harper government lost the U.N. Security Council seat in in 2010 was because there is a lot of hostility to Canada's position around the world, and one of the elements of that hostility is the the repeated uh, Canadian sabotaging, undermining of of international climate negotiation meetings, of just basic statements at different Commonwealth meetings to 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 you know, make statements about uh, global warming. The Conservatives have, have opposed uh, those efforts on a number of occasions, and and I think that in the case of um, the U.S., there is a growing uh, recognition among the U.S. left, particularly in the environmental movement, I guess specifically, that uh, that Canadian uh, sort of economic and political interests are. Are, uh, are 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 not uh, not on their side, and and I think that's somewhat of a of a change. I think there used to be more of a perception of Canada as being somewhat of a progressive force, and uh, I think that's increasingly increasingly changing. All right, thanks for joining us, Eve. We're going to continue uh, going through the different chapters of Eve's book, which deal with different elements of Harper foreign policy. So stay tuned and look for look for the next segment of our interview with Eve Angler on the Real News Network. And don't forget, we're in the midst of our uh, end of year fundraising campaign. We have a hundred thousand dollar matching grant, which we need to match if we're going to keep doing Real News in 2013. So there's a donate button over here. Please click it, because if you don't, we can't do this.